over the next short while is we're going to look how sailors, the job of sailors is to make the boat go round the racetrack as quickly as possible, irrespective of what else is happening. Whether they're in traffic or by themselves, whether in a gust or a lull, waves, flat water. Obviously that potential speed will vary, but it's our job to make sure that we get as close to that potential speed as we can. Our environment is complicated, but luckily, thank goodness, the actual principle that defines how a boat moves is actually pretty straightforward. What actually happens is, somewhere up here in the sails, movement is generated. That movement is then moved to the hull, through the mast and through the shrouds, and it's only then that the hull starts to do its business and it actually starts to go through the water, and it's only then that the sailors can actually do their business with, the, with that movement. In order to make sure the boat is going as fast as possible all the time, we have two different jobs. First of all, job number one is to make sure that the sails are delivering the maximum amount of squirt that they possibly can. But it's no good just having the most beautiful setting sails if we're then presenting to the water a hull that's inefficient. Our job is to not only make sure the sails are going as quickly as possible, but also to make sure the hull is minimising the drag. There's the least amount of resistance to the boat through the water. Golden rule number one is that the boat must be upright. Designers have it, so the right-hand side and the left-hand side are the same shape. If we don't allow the water to go around those curves, we're going to get an asymmetric hull form, creating different waves, creating turbulence, and we're going to go slower. Now, because this is so important, how on earth do we know that, it, that we're getting it right? And we're so lucky. Gee whiz, are we so lucky? All helms have to do, all helms have to do is just ease their grip on the tiller. If the tiller stays down the centre line of the boat, the boat is making the least amount of resistance. Water's going from her front to back around the same curves. If the tiller moves one way or the other, then we're creating more resistance than we should be. The tiller will always, will always move to the area, the problem area. So if the tiller moves to leeward, the boat's heeling over to leeward, much harder to achieve. If it moves to windward, then the boat's heeling to windward. Release the group on the tiller, I don't know, not that often, 20, 30, 40,000 times a leg, just to be 100% sure that the boat is dead upright. The main problem is not when we're beating or reaching, the main problem with this is on a run. When, when how do you put it, elderly, perhaps, well not perhaps, definite overweight helms are sitting to leeward, you know, leaning on the boom, because that gives their elbows something to do, uh, what are they going to do? The likelihood is that the young crew on the windward side playing the spinnaker is not going to be able to keep the boat upright. And it's on the run, if you're going to make a cock up, if it's on the run that you have the maximum amount of damage. Boat going with the wind, little lack of movement, sails hardly moving, we're in dead trouble. Make sure the tiller is eased from time to time in order to check the boats upright. The other thing we have to do is just to check what's happening, where we've been, what's the wash like? Obviously, and I hope it's, it will be clear, the smoother the wash, the, the, the faster the boat will be going. Think about a flat out plane. Think about, if you think about it, the, the water's billiard table smooth behind the, the transom, and yet 20, 30, depending how fast we're going, 40 meters behind the boat, there's a sort of rooster tail where the side washes meet. Do you know what that rooster tail is? It's the water saying, bugger it, I'm going to create turbulence here. And so far as the water is concerned, the boat's a 30, 40, 50 meter long boat. So no wonder it's going. Sadly, we can't always plane but we can monitor that performance even when we're hardly moving by looking at the size of the bubbles. The flatter the wash, the smoother the wash, the less turbulent the wash, the faster the boat will go. Sit further forward just to check, oh that doesn't look so good, nibble back a little bit just to see. Once we've got that sorted, we can then start to talk about how to deal with how the sails are maximizing the available squirt. A sail works, any sail, main jib and spinnaker when it's reaching, any sail works when we're beating and reaching by separating the airflow. Some of the air will go around on the windward surface and some of the air will go around on the leeward surface. Now we don't need to get too complicated. 
It, all we need to know as a result of this separation of airflow, a pressure gradient is created between the more dense air on the windward side and the less dense air on the leeward side. If you think about it, there therefore is a movement from the thick, from the dense air to the less pressure on the leeward side, all the way around the camber of the sail. Some of it is a diagonal forwards bit, and when we're pinned in like Alex has got the sail at the moment, when we're beating with a sail like this, there's a hell of a lot of it's a sideways force. Which means, which is why when we're beating we have to do all that sitting out nonsense and stuff to keep the boat upright. And if we were mega stupid and overcook the leech, really hook the leech, then some of it would be actually dragged going back the way we've just come. Although all three sails work when we're, be when we're reaching and the two sails when we're beating work in that way, within the sail plan, different bits of the sails do different jobs. The job of the leading edge of the jib is responsible for how close the boat will point. But because the jib stops here, we've also got to include this bit of the main as well. So above the top of the jib, and the leading edge of the jib are responsible for how close we can get the boat into wind. If you're five degrees, only five, you can't measure five degrees, but if you're only five degrees further off the wind than you should be, do you know how much extra distance you're sailing in half a mile? It's 75 meters. Now, if you want the beating to last forever, if you like your tummy hurting, you know, if you don't want to get on that reach, then for goodness sake, don't, point very well. But me, I want to get, I want to get it around that and start me, me reaching stuff, pointing as high as possible. So it's dead critical to get this absolutely right. We have two controls. We have the angle of the sheet through the fair lid, which I, uh, Alex is going to do in a minute, and we also have the amount of rig tension. So let's do the sheeting angle first. Right. I'm not that bothered about the actual position of the fair lead. It's the rule I use, it's close enough if you extend the line of the sheet from the fair lead through the clue and you extend it right to the luff, if it's just below halfway, that's about right. Doesn't matter whether it's a cadet, albacore, wayfarer, all of those sort of boats, RS200, so long as it's just below halfway, that will be about right. Because the critical thing and this is why we have to rely so much on our crews, is the big critical thing is the amount of tension posed on it. Can you pull it in really tight, Alex? Right, now look at the leech, please, people. Now, Alex is only going to ease the sheet, well, for youngsters, Steve, 25 mil, right, an inch for the rest of us. Right, okay, off you go. How much did the leech move? Pull it in that 25 mil, please. A hell of a lot, isn't it? So tiny little bits of sheet movement have an awful effect on the back edge of the sail. The ratio, believe it or not, is five to one. Every unit you move the sheet through the fair lead, the middle leech, where the spreaders are, will move five times that distance. We can use that movement in order to make sure we've got a constant angle of attack. And this is where we need to enlist the help of telltales. Half height, sorry, quarter height, half height, and three quarter height. They will ape, they will tell us what the air is doing. So if they're flowing, the air is flowing. If they circle, the air flow is broken down. If we've got the sheet tension right, all three telltales will be at the same sort of angle. Now look at the effect, what Alex, we're talking about the front but of the sail. Look at the effect on the front of the sail when Alex eases that sheet again. I'm going to put my finger on it. Ease away, please, Alex. Can you see what's happening? Sheet it in, please. And do it once more. Right. Leech tension not only controls the back edge of the sail, but as I've just shown you there, it actually alters the angle of attack. So what we're trying to do, get the sheet to about halfway, and then nuances of leech tension in order to create the telltales working at the same sort of angle. Golden rule. The windward telltales, as soon as the boat's at walking pace, the windward telltales will be angled up three, four miles an hour, something like that. The windward telltales will all be angled up. Now, why should they be angled up? Well, think about it. 
there's that amount of boat going through the air, what's going to happen to the air it's displacing? What's going to happen to the air that's from here? It moves up and up and up and up and up. So there is a diagonal upward movement over the leading edge of the sail plan caused purely and simply by the passage of the boat through the air. And we've got to ape that movement. So if the telltales are all at 45 degrees, angled up when we're at walking pace, the sheet tension is about right. If the top telltale stalls, starts to do its circle on the windward side, that means the leech is too slack, and so the leech has got to be brought just a fraction, tiny amount, please, Alex. Beautiful. If the top telltale goes, you tighten the leech just a snippet, just to get it to work. By the same token, if the bottom telltale starts to circle, you've stalled the bottom of the sail, this time the leech is too tight, so Alex has got to... And what will happen, you will find that very quickly, you'll just learn it, find out the amount of sheet tension you need for any specific day just to get all three telltales angled up. If you don't angle the telltales up, do you remember the 5% rule, 5 degree rule? You're back into sailing 75 meters further than you actually should be. Absolute nonsense. I've, I've actually had people say, oh no, no, Michael, I put both telltales at the same angle. Rubbish. Get the windward one up as high as you can, and the faster the boat goes, 420s, 470s, fireballs, all that lot, the telltale, the windward telltale will be almost vertical. The leeward telltale haven't got the luxury of this air pouring over the windward side of the mainsail. So the leeward telltales will be horizontal. If the leeward telltale is horizontal, the further apart we get them up, the closer the boat is pointing to the wind, the closer we're getting to the windward mark, and therefore the closer we can start that reaching stuff, the stuff we really like. Right? Now, while we're dealing with the front of the sail, force two, beautiful little breeze, and then suddenly from Richard over there, an extra force five comes, black lines on the water, extra wind about. Helmsman thinks, oh God, my crew's gonna have to sit out, I might have to lean on him or something, you know. But not only does the, that extra gust have an effect on the healing of the boat, it also has a big effect on what's happening to the front of the sail. As that horrible black squall rushes towards this poor, dear, defenceless jib, the effect of it is, are you going to hold for a minute? In fact, stay put. What will actually happen is under the onslaught of that extra wind, the front of the jib will sag away from the wind. The trouble is, as I'm showing here, I hope, that not only is it sagging away from the wind, but look what's happening, it's getting fuller. Yes, right at the front. Can you see that, I hope? As it gets fuller right at the front, what's that going to do to the, our poor pointing? It's going to send us back to the, down the tubes. Think about it, not being able to point in a breeze, not being able to point close to the wind, the wind's going to hit you more from the side. More of that sitting out stuff? No, no, I don't think so. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at the lured shroud as our best judge of whether we've got the right amount of rig tension. What we're trying to do is we will know that the, we're, we're minimizing the disaster of jibbluff sag if we look at the lured shroud. If the lured shroud is visibly slack, that means the mast is clunking over to lured, we will have luff sag to excess and that will affect our pointing. What I like to see as I'm sailing along, whether it's in my Wayfarer or, or Albuquerque or Hornet or whatever, I like to just see the lured telltale just on the point of just shimmering. If it's just on the shimmering, that's as the best I can do. And that's as good enough for me. Now, once we've dealt with the front of the jib, the air, of course, doesn't just stop here. It carries its onwards passage. And this is where it goes to the speed-making machine. As it squeezes through the gap, as the air goes through the gap between the windward back of the jib and the leeward front of the main, it's an ever-narrowing gap. Because it's an ever narrowing gap, the air has to speed up. As it speeds up, it becomes less dense. As it becomes less dense, it accentuates the pressure gradient between the more dense air on the windward side of the mainsail and the less dense air on the leeward side of the mainsail. It makes the mainsail that much more efficient right at the front, right where the best part of the forward arrow is going and gives us that squirt that we're so desperate for. So getting the slot right is our passport to windward speed. So how do we do it? 
We use sheet tension, nuances of sheet tension to get all the telltales to work on the leading edge and we do exactly the same thing by, can you see I, we fitted a leech telltale at three quarter height. If that leech, sorry, let me show you. If that leech telltale is streaming, if air is jet propulsioning off the back, if air is going off both sides equally, that will stream, won't it? And that must mean the, the jib's at its most efficient. If that telltale breaks down, it, it will always go to the area where it's broken down. If Alex has sheeted it in too much, if the leech is too tight, the telltale will go, always go to the leeward side. So not only are we looking at the telltales when we're looking at sheet tension, so pull it in a little bit, please, Alex. Right, now you're going to ease it about 20, right, tightish, pull it tight. Ease it about 20 mil. Right, stop, uh, that's perfect trying to get that top leech telltale to set. If it's jet propulsioning, the sail's right. By coincidence, what that will mean, and thank good it's by coincidence, what that will mean is the leech of the jib in this area here will be parallel to the center line of the boat. On some classes, like the cadet, it's even more important, to, with a tiny little jib, it's desperately important to make sure that the leech is parallel to the... So how does the crew know that? What I do is I dive to leeward in the lightest stuff, I have a look at the leech of the jib, and what I say to my dear crew, I say, dear old Alex, what I want you to do is to aim that part of the sheet, that part of the sheet, to a point on the transom. Put a mark there. In the Wayfarer, it's where the side deck is. In the Cadet, it's where the, the leeward main sheet block is. Uh, just aim for there and there. I mean, Helmsman, whether we like it or not in light winds, our crews, our Alex's, are responsible for the boat speed because they're down to leeward, they're looking at the leech of their jib, they're making sure that that telltale's working, they're making sure that the exit of the sail in the middle is dead parallel to the center line of the boat. What we haven't done is talk much about here. The problem with a mainsail, is if you think about it, the problem with a mainsail is a mainsail is only a mainsail if it's got a jib in front of it. If it hasn't got a jib in front of it, it's a jib because that's the first thing the wind is hitting. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether it's your lazy, your solo, or all our sort of boats, even your Merlin rockets, our sort of boats, above the top of the jib, the mainsail has to be sheeted as a jib. We've seen, I hope, with the case of the jib, that the responsibility for organizing the angle of attack and the responsibility for organizing the leech came down to the amount of tension that the crew that Alex put on the back bottom corner. And it's exactly the same, exactly the same with the mainsail. We've got various controls. We're gonna do the main sheet first, Alex. Can you pull it in really tight? We've got various controls to control the leech of the sail. With the boom close to the center line, the main sheet has to be the control that's organizing the leech. Now you're going to ease it about 20 mil, please. About 20 mil? A little bit more. Right. Look at this movement here, folks. Sheet it in about an inch, please, Alex. Way more than an inch. Massive amount. So tiny little bits of tension on here have a hell of an effect up here. And because it's so critical, we're dead lucky that we've got a lovely guide. We're so lucky we've got this guide here. You will know, you will always know, irrespective of the wind strength, whether the amount of load on the back bottom corner is right by looking at this bit here. This is the bit, how would you call it? This is the bit where the mainsail becomes schizophrenic. It doesn't quite know whether it's a main or it doesn't quite know whether it's a jib at this point here. So this is the point where it will always cause a problem. This is the point where it will always backwind. So, if the sail backwinds here, can you use the main sheet, just a, a tiny amount, that's it, whoop. If the mainsail is backwinding here, by backwinding I mean air's hitting the leeward side. If air's hitting the leeward side, all we've got to do is to tension with the boom into the center line, just a little bit, just to bring it back into action. Now this, boat here has got this wonderful bridle here to stop very strong helmsmen from oversheating, from pulling in too tight. Look at the effect, just ease it for a second. Look at the effect on the leech 
if we overcome that a bit more, if you would. Right, OK. Right, now pull it again, please. Has that gone tighter? I'm going to let it, have you cleated? Right, cleat it. Yeah. Watch. So vertical load on the back bottom corner has a hell of an effect on the leech higher up. As an effect that will crucify the boat speed unless we use as our motto, our reason for being, our only reason for being main sheet setting is just what is happening here. Golden rule, is it backwinding? Yes, sheet it in. Is it not backwinding? No, ease it out. Because a sail is at its most efficient, at its most efficient when it's deflecting the air the minimum amount possible. If we overdo it, we're gonna hook the leech and we're gonna go slowly. Right. As soon as the boom's away from the center line, can you move the boom away from the center line as if there was a breeze? Quite away, please. I mean, just look what's happening up there. So the main sheet can no longer take control of the leech tension. So now, please, Alex, it's got to be the control of your kicking strap. Just watch the effect of tension in the kicker. Right? Again, just tensioning, loading the back bottom corner to bring the leech into play. How much again? It's dead easy. Is it backwinding? Yes, you need more kicker. Is it not backwinding? No, you need less kicker. It's as straightforward and as simple as that. Now, bring the boom back into the center, please. We're just going to look at the effect. The boom like this, we've already seen that when they eased the mainsail, the main sheet, the leech opened up like mad. Right, are you ready? I'm going to, I want you to, people over there will be able to see it. Look at the effect of mass bend. Keep it cleated. Look at the effect of mass bend when I pull the main sheet over tight. Whereabouts is the mass bending? And look at the top, please, folks. Can you see, I hope, that most of the bend is being generated up here. Most of it's between here and here. Of course it's meant to be up there. Of course it's meant to be a vertical tension, a, a vertical load, simply because of the, the, what I've done with the main sheet. Right. Now look at the difference in mass bend. Leave the main sheet where it is. Well, let the main sheet out of soup song and then pull in the kicker. All this work, Alex, thank you. Good job, you're a good crew. Right. OK, look at the difference in mass bend now. Look what happens to the front of this mast, front of the sail, when he starts to use the kicker. Off you go then, please. Right. Look here, folks. Right, ease it again, please. Now you're going to pull it in quite tight, please. All your strength, yeah. Go on, that's better. Right, now let it go. Right. Because the kicker, this wonderful gadget, the, the, because the kicker is angled at 45 degrees to both the mast and the boom, it's not only got a, the, the downward component, yeah, it's got the downward component, but what it has got is it's got a forward component, a component that thrusts the mast forward because the mast is bending, because it's thrust forwards, just look at the effect on sail shape. Yes, please. Kick it quite a lot. What's happening is the kicker is, uh, because the mast is bending, the sail is getting wider. Because it's getting wider, it's getting flatter. Because it's getting flatter, the big plus, the wonderful plus, is it, look what it's doing to the slot. Hang on, stay put. I'm going to put my finger there. Let's get rid of that. Right, OK, let, let's straighten the mass, please. Can you see, I hope? Right, so flattening out the front of the mainsail has this wonderful, wonderful positive thing of actually opening the gap between the jib and the mainsail. Let more air going through the gap. So we're organizing the kicker so that it's just not backwinding here. The byproduct of that, the wonderful byproduct of that, is it not only by using the kicker, it bends the mast to flatten the sail to open the gap between the jib and the main. To open that gap, why are we doing all this extra kickering? Why are we needing to do all this? Because there's more wind about, more wind trying to pour through that lovely slot. So by bending the mast, we're overcoming the vertical strength of the mast and enabling more air to get through the gap ever so important on the Wayfair with its big overlapping jib. Now, what we haven't done is talk about the back edge of the sail. Once the air is finished with the leading edge of the, the sail, it's actually got to come to the back of the sail. 
Have you ever been in that situation? Inland sailors will be well aware of this. What, will ha what happens is force two, that lovely force two, suddenly the extra gust comes. As soon as that extra gust comes, if we haven't got enough kicking strap, what will actually, haven't got enough downward load on the back bottom corner, what will happen is the sail will actually start to flog it. Not backwind, but actually to physically flap. If it flaps, if it flogs, that's drag, if that's, and drag of course is slow. But it's even worse, it, the drag is terrible, but it's even worse to what's happening to the poor old hull underneath it. <coughs> In windy conditions, if the boat's heating over and then upright, heating over and then upright, heating over and then upright, that's usually because the mainsail is not being treated as a barn door to be open and closed according to how much wind is going through. If the sail is flogging, you will actually find suddenly power is generated and the boat heels over. The helm dumps the power and then the boat comes up. Oh, bugger, start. And before you know it, you've got, you're into a yo-yo and it's really hard to organise. What we're trying to do with the load on the back bottom corner Right, pull it in please, uh, kicker, yep, well done. Right, what we're trying to do, and now you're going to ease the main sheet please. Right, look at the leech, look at this angle here, this curvature here, ease the, yeah. Right, what's happened now is because the leech is firm, because the leech is solid, because the downward force is there, all that, Ale, all the helm needs to do, all the helm needs to do is to move the boom in and out according to how much wind is in. Crew out, sitting out, helmsman leaning on the crew for a bit of comfort. You know, if that's not enough, then the main sheet's got to go out. As soon as the boat's upright, main sheet's got to come back in. And all we're doing with that force on that corner is organising backwind here, minimising the backwind. Now, when it gets to the back edge of the sail, we've got gadgets. Sheet him in again, please, Alex. We've got gadgets on the back edge, telltales, to tell us what's happening to the air. If the air is going off the back edge, if both sides of the sail are producing maximum amount of squirt, if the air is pouring off both edges, so it's jet propulsioning off the back edge, the telltales will be streaming backwards. If the telltales break down and go one side of the sail or the other side of the sail, that means that the airflow is broken down on that side of the sail. It's more general that the airflow goes round on the leeward side. This time from that force six to force two. Boat feels terrific. It's a real gazelle of the ocean as you hammer through the wind and then suddenly the wind stops. And the boat, well, what does a boat feel like? As if you're sailing through treacle. Now sailing at my places on the Norfolk boards, what was that? It's clearly I've sailed into weed, haven't I? No, I mean, it could be weed. It could be, but I tell you what it certainly is, is what's happened is because you had the sail set for four six, because you had the leech tension organised for four six, what's actually happened is the wind has switched off and the leech has gone boing like that. And what's actually happened is that the air says, I'm not going to follow those lured curves. I'm not going to go around all those edges. I'm going to break off halfway across the sail. So right when you need maximum amount of squirt, you end up reefing your sail, for goodness sake. Golden rule. At the first hint that it feels awful, mainsail out, please. Mainsail right out, ease the kicker a little bit. And what we're trying to do is generate the backwinding here. If in doubt, let it out. If in doubt, let it out until it backwinds here. And then, bring it back in again, please. Pull, yeah. Just enough, just enough, just a, whoa, just to get it to set here. And then just to be sure, was I right? Out it goes again, minimizing the curve that the air has to go round. If in doubt, let it out. Backwinding, even with my eyesight, I can see the sails backwinding and I can deal with it. Good. Which of the telltales is the hardest one to get to set? The bottom one will be working nearly always beautifully well because it's got that lovely jet stream of air round through the slot, powering the air out the back of the sail. The top of the sail plant, the top telltale, is relatively easy to get to work by just organising the tension. I reckon it's this one here, 
It's the leech telltale closest to the top of the jib. It's the leech telltale where the mainsail is in its schizophrenic mode. Not quite sure whether it's a mainsail or not quite sure whether it's a jib. One of these days, I don't know, I don't know whether you can starch nylon to make it set all the time, but, <laughs> but I don't worry about the second one down. It's got, too, it's got too much of a problem dealing with a problem that's happening there. So this is the one I look at. Have I got enough leech, ten leech tail te tension to get the top tail set? Is it jet propulsioning off the back edge? Then the sail's right. If it goes round to the leeward side, I've got to ease the kicker. Yeah, until it starts to stream and then just gently bring it back on. Being very aware that I don't want to go too far, so I've got massive backwinding here. <clears throat> now there are two more gadgets we need to deal with. Right, bring the boom into the centre line, please, Alec. Put quite a lot of kicker on, if you'd be so kind. A bit more. Can you see that as Alex, because of this lovely, powerful kicking strap, because of the forward force involved, he's bent the mast, and because he's bent the mast, he's compressed the back of the sail. Lots of wrinkles on that. Now, if you had a photograph taken of that, how would you... You can put it on the mantelpiece, could you, and show it to Grandma. So, what we're going to do is use the Cunningham. Just enough and only just enough. Go on, a bit more, squidge more, squidge more, squidge more. Right, whoop. Just to tidy up most of it, if we have time. Golden rule, kick her on to organize the leech tension so this is all right. And if we have time, and if there's a cameraman about, of course, then we have to just organize the Cunningham. Right, now, just put a bit more Cunningham on, please, Alex. Right, okay. Now, this is where we need to be brave. Are you ready for this? Look at the effect of the, on the sail if he eases the kicking strap and straightens the mast, but he doesn't do anything to the Cunningham. Look at the full horror. Off you go. Okay, what's happened to the position of the flow? The flow's moved right forward, miles forward, right behind the mast. Well, what the hell, that doesn't matter. I tell you what, it does matter, because if you guys look at the slot here, there just isn't any. This is the sort of gap between the jib and the main that will cause backwinding. And by backwinding, the boat's going to go slower. Right, so let's get rid of the Cunningham. So the rule is, kick her on. If you have time, tart up the sail in our sort of boats by pulling on the Cunningham. Kick her off, and whatever ever, ever, ever else happens on that boat is the Cunningham must go off. Better to have the wrinkles. We can even call them speed bumps if we like because at least the flow is back. At least it's allowing the air to curve round the leading edge of the sail and not have a right angle bend. Yes? Good. One last gadget. Clue out all, please, Alex. It's on the boom. Before we adjust it, just look at the shape of the sail here and look at the leading edge of the sail. Right. In light winds, we want the foot, when we're beating we want the foot so tight that it's really straining. This is fullness, this crease means fullness is coming out of it. By tensioning like mad, we're opening out this bit of the sail. We're making it as flat as possible to allow the slow, tired moving air to cling to that lured surface as long as possible. Look at the effect on this, piece, this bit of sail here when Alex actually starts to ease the clue in. Thank you, Alex. Can you see that this point is moving here? Pull it out again, please. Right, I'm going to put my finger on it. Now let it go off, please, Alex. Can you see? Yeah, a bit more. Let's go a bit more. Right. Can you see, I hope, that they were actually asking the air to bend round to... Why should it do that? You must be joking, Michael. I'm not going to bother to do that. And we're talking light winds here. So right when we want a maximum width sail, what have we got? A sail where the air is breaking off over here. We're reefing the back edge of the sail. In a breeze, we want the foot to be really, really, really tight. Not so much because we're bothered about the back edge, but because here... Right, tension it like mad, please, Alex. Right. And, OK, let it go, please. OK. What happens is if the sail is, t if we ease the sail too much at the front, what are we doing to the slot? We're closing the slot off 
and yet there's more wind about. So bar tight when the crew is too heavy and the crew's inside the boat. Bar tight when the crew, same crew of course, same crew is too light and poor devil's having to sit out like mad. But for that glorious five minutes on your birthday, on July the 18th, you know, when, it's, when the crew is the perfect weight, you can perhaps just ease the, the clue, just a snippet, just so that the sail is on the point of backwinding. Now, we've dealt with beating and reaching by the way that the air separates the, the sorry, the sail is separated, separates the air. Now we need to do the run. Of course, I mean, we, and sadly I'm afraid we can't demonstrate it here, but the run is slow. Everybody knows the run is slow. Of course the run is slow because the very boat speed of through the, through the water reduces the amount of wind strength. Of course it happens. But do you know the main reason, the main reason we go slowly on a run? It's because we halve the sail area. When we're beating and reaching, both sides of the sail are working. When we're on a dead run, all that's happening is it's just pressure up the backside. But having said that, We've got to make sure that the air is ab still able to escape, even on a run. And all we need to do now, boom out about two feet, if you would. Right, now you're going to uh, cleat him up. You're going to organize the kicking out. Right, <coughs> pull it tight, please. Right, what we're after doing is looking at the middle leech, usually sail number area. If if we've got the right amount of downward load on the back bottom corner, and remember it has to be from the kicker because the boom's away from the center line, every time there's an extra little bit of an increase in wind strength, the middle leech will move forwards by about four inches, 100 mils, something like that. If it doesn't move at all, it will stop the air escaping and the boat will go slowly. But shall I demonstrate if you've got it too loose? Certainly in the case of, definitely in the case of wayfarers, albacores and the like. Shall I demonstrate what happens? As the helm swims back to the centre board, because he's fallen, it's because you've rock and roll capsized. Just have enough downward tension on a run, just so the middle leech moves forward every time the wind goes forward. What we've got to do, what we've got to do of course, is to make sure that wayfarer type spinnakers, symmetrical type spinnakers, the spinnaker's brought round as far round as possible, not just to accept the wind that's coming up the chuff, important as that is, but also to accept the air that's pouring off the front of the mainsail. And that's why we've got to whisk a pole as soon as possible to get the air pouring off the front of the mainsail. Of course, lollipop boats like these don't run anymore. You know, they don't, if the mark's down there, they don't go straight down there, they go over there first and then back over there and, you know, this. Why do they do that? Purely and simply because the reason they're doing that is because they're still wanting the air to be on both surfaces. They're still wanting the air to go around both surfaces. Of course, there's an extra distance involved, so they've got to go faster. So it's a trade-off between sailing the extra distance and, and actually sailing the shortest distance. So, with a lollipop type, type boat, an asymmetric type boat, we want the air going over both surfaces so that we broad reach downwind. On a wayfarer with the symmetrical spinnakers, we want to just get the, wind, the spinnaker around as far as possible to accept the air that's pouring off the front of the jib, up front of the mainsail. Good. So what we've done then is we've talked about the passage of air over the sail plan all the way around the racetrack. We've seen the effect of jib sheeting and rig tension on the front of the jib. We've seen the effect of mass bend and the kicking strap and main sheet on the front of the mainsail, not only the front of the mainsail, but the effect it has on the back edge. But the one thing that I would strongly, strongly leave you with is, if in doubt, let it out, because the front will backwind and you can deal with it. Never dictate, always react. That's it, thank you very much. <laughs>